Today on the show, we have a couple of stinkers, getting even with Dad with Macaulay Culkin, and serving Sarah with Matthew Perry. Ugh. Good fucking God. All right, everyone, welcome to Brandon at Random Reviews. I am your host, Brandon Griffiths. Thank you for joining me today. I do appreciate it. Uh, You know, I I decided I wanted to go in another direction for at least an episode and talk about movies that I'm not such a fan of, and especially movies that I've never seen that I just know I'm not going to be a fan of based on, you know, critics' ratings and internet lists and things like that, and I wanted to do ones that I hadn't seen covered by another podcast, you know, because I mean, I I love the podcast, like, How Did This Get Made, where they talk about bad movies, and then there's also another uh, podcast called We Hate Movies, and that's also a similar topic. It's it's basically just movies that are, are terrible, and they, they talk about them, and they, uh, you know, go through why they're so bad. And I'm not going to necessarily emulate either of those as much, but I just wanted to, you know, for an episode, I wanted to not rant and rave about how wonderful something was, and I wanted to see how things would go if I talked about terrible movies, okay? The first on the list is Getting Even With Dad, which came out on June 17th, 1994, directed by Howard Deutsch. Uh, He directed a bunch of episodes of Young Sheldon and Empire. Young Sheldon I've seen. My mom is a big fan of that show. I think it's hot garbage, but, you know, what can you do? Uh, Empire, I, I haven't seen any of. I've heard mixed things about it. I mean, apparently it's it's pretty well regarded, but I I don't know. Uh he his first movie that he directed was Pretty in Pink, which is a solid teen movie from the 80s. Some kind of wonderful, which I don't know that I've ever actually seen that one. The Great Outdoors with John Candy and I think it's Dan Aykroyd. I think I've seen like a little bit of it and it it struck me as like a shitty fucking movie that I I didn't want any part of and I, I might be wrong on that. I might be, you know, going over the top, but as far as I could tell, it didn't look good. Howard Deutsch Also did a movie called Article 99, which I am not familiar with. He did Grumpier Old Men. Not Grumpy Old Men, Grumpier, so the second one. He did The Odd Couple 2. He did The Replacements with Keanu Reeves. He did the whole 10 yards, not the whole 9 yards. He did My Best Friend's Girl, which I never saw. And yeah, I mean, I'm really, I'm on the fence. I don't know about that great outdoors movie. It seems like it would suck, so I don't know. I don't think I'm going to dive into that. Writing-wise, we've got a guy named Jim Genowine. Genowine? Genowine? I don't I don't know how you pronounce that name, but uh, he wrote some pretty bad movies. Stay Tuned, which I've always heard, and actually We Hate Movies makes reference to that movie or at least just says, stay tuned. If they if they come across, you know, they're in conversation, they bring up a movie that they haven't covered on the podcast, and they think it would be like a good We Hate Movies, you know, subject. They, they say that, oh, that's a total stay tuned, you know? Uh, there's also Richie Rich, which is another Macaulay Culkin movie. Uh, he, he made the first, the live action uh, Flintstones movie, and then he made Major League Two. Writing wise, like I haven't seen any of those other than the Flintstones, but I've never heard a single good word about any of those other ones. I mean, just just horrendously bad. As far as the uh, the the composer, I mean, the score of this movie was pretty fucking terrible. I mean, I, I didn't. It was really generic and it was cheesy at a lot of times. Uh, it was it was composed by a man named Miles Goodman. And he's actually done some pretty solid movies. I mean, I don't really remember the scores of these movies. Being There, The Verdict, The Original Teen Wolf with Michael J. Fox, Footloose, 
about last night, which I can't even remember what the fuck that is. Why is that not sticking out? Little Shop of Horrors, La Bamba, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, What About Bob, House Sitter, Sister Act 2, Dunstan Checks In, and, you know, I mean, that's that's all I could really find on it. And, and I mean, I haven't seen most of those movies, other, you know, a select few of them, but they're seeming like they're terrible, you know? Like, maybe he's just got a reputation for doing bad movies or mediocre movies, I don't know. But we, as we move on to the cast, we've, of course, got top build Macaulay Culkin in this movie. He plays a character named Timmy Gleason. He is the, uh... Obviously, you know, you, you you know Macaulay Culkin. If you're an American living right now, you fucking know who Macaulay Culkin is, I hope. Uh, he, was, he was originally in. The first thing I think he really stood out in was Uncle Buck. And then he was in Jacob's Ladder. And I think he was uncredited in Jacob's Ladder. He was in both of the first two Home Alone movies, which were really his breakout movies. And he was in My Girl and The Good Son, where he played the bad son, I believe. I, I haven't seen that movie in a really long time. And he was also in that Richie Rich movie, which, no thanks. And then his dad, his character's dad, excuse me, uh, is played by Ted Danson. His name's Ray Gleason. And you know Ted Danson. You know him from Cheers. You know him from uh, uh, he, the, the other show he was on was Becker, and he was on uh, later seasons of CSI, like super late seasons of CSI. I don't know if they're still doing those or not. Uh, he was in the movie Three Men and a Baby. He was in Saving Private Ryan. I couldn't really find many other movies that stuck out, and it seemed odd to me that you had Ted Danson. He just seems like he's been in movies, but really he hasn't. Not not like notable movies. Uh, next up, we've got Glenn Headley. Headley? I don't know. She played Teresa. I, I've heard that name pronounced. I mean, I've heard Teresa, Teresa, Teresa. Make up your mind, people. Just what, what do you want it to be? And we'll go with that. But just decide. She is, she actually plays a police officer in this movie. You might know her from uh, Glenn, Glenn Headley. I'm just going to call her Glenn Headley. She was in the movie The Purple Rose of Cairo. She was in Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, Dick Tracy, and I know her best from Mr. Holland's Opus, which is definitely a movie I'm going to cover on this podcast at some point. I just don't know when. Another guy that was in this movie was Saul Rubinek. He plays uh, Bobby and he was in the original Wall Street with Michael Douglas. He was in Unforgiven, that Clint Eastwood movie from the early 90s or late 80s. I can't remember which. Uh, he was in True Romance. That's what I know him best from. He was in the movie The Family Man, which I think is a Nicolas Cage vehicle. He was in Rush Hour 2, which I've forgotten Rush Hour 2 almost completely. I mean, I, I still enjoy the first one, even though it's a bit much. You also get Hector El Elizondo, which you've seen him in other things. I know him as the voice of Bane from Batman the Animated Series, but I mean he's a solid actor. He's he's been in a lot of a lot of different small parts. <laughs> There's a, okay, so in the beginning of this movie, we meet Ted Danson's character, and then we meet Macaulay Culkin's character, and Macaulay Culkin is riding with two people, and you don't really understand who these people are, and it turns out that it's, like, his aunt and her new husband, and they want to go on their honeymoon, and they're going to ditch Macaulay Culkin at the dad's house, right? Or at the dad's apartment, I should say. And so you're kind of confused, but, like, it, I just found it hilarious because I spotted the guy that was playing her husband. It was the guy who plays, like, the chief on Law & Order SVU, or at least he originally did, and I just, I, I only know him from that, you know what I mean? So it just, like, it stood out. But anyway, so he's in this movie. I didn't look up who is, what his name was because I didn't think it was relevant. <laughs> I noted that, uh, so I made... I kind of took this in a different direction than I do most other movies. I don't know, you know, if this is going to be the way it always will be with movies going forward. But I, for these bad movies, I really wanted to just have a little more of a, a discussion of what happens in the plot and what terrible things are going on. The first thing I noted, other than 
the guy from Law and Order SVU was that it was it was this like super generic score that was trying to like conjure emotions out of me that I I wasn't feeling that just weren't there. I didn't I didn't give a shit about what anything was that was going. I had no vested interest in Macaulay Culkin's character or Ted Danson's character. I didn't give a shit. They were just two people. I I hadn't been around them long enough to give two shits about, you know, they they both seemed like terrible people to be completely frank, even though, you know, and, and if I refer to Macaulay Culkin as Kevin McAllister, I apologize. It's just that's what I know him as. He's Kevin McAllister from Home Alone. That's who he'll always be to me. So my favorite part that I, like my first big observation aside from the score was Ted Danson. He plays an ex-con, you know, a guy that he was in prison and he is out now and he's he's trying to orchestrate this coin heist, right? And it's very flimsy and lame what what the actual plot is of this movie, you know, like what what elements are surrounding it. It's just dumb. I mean, I I really don't think it's a good plot, but and so these in the beginning of the movie, Ted Danson is hanging out with these two other guys, and they're also supposed to be ex-cons, right? And they just, they, they didn't look like they had done time. They had Ted Danson in what I'm positive was a fucking wig or a weave of some, I mean, like, he he had a ponytail, and it's his hair was just a fucking matted rat's nest. It was horrendous. I mean, and it looked so dumb on him. I mean, he just does not look... And I gotta ask this question before I get to it in my notes, because it's already starting to bug me. Do people think Ted Danson is a good-looking man? Or is it the thing that I always notice with certain guys that are, you know, they're taller... They're, they're tall and dark, but I don't know if they bring it home on the handsome, but people act like they're still very good looking. I, I just, I gotta know, listeners, do you think Ted Danson is a good looking guy or what's the story there? I just, I need to know the deal. So when Macaulay Culkin gets dropped off at Ted Danson's, he gives Ted Danson a picture. He's like, here's a picture of me with mom. And it's a it's a photograph of Macaulay Culkin sitting on the ground next to a tombstone with his like his arm up on the tombstone. And I'm like, oh god, like that's that's how you break that the the mom pass. Like you couldn't you couldn't squeeze it in. Like that's how you know the writing is fucking solid. You know, it's like, oh yeah, you know, we couldn't just you know squeeze in there that. You know, his mother had passed away at some point. We had to put Macaulay Culkin on the fucking ground next to a goddamn tombstone and have that be the way that, that we find out. And I it just, I busted out laughing. I mean, it, I, I couldn't tell if it was supposed to be a joke or if it was literally that ham-fisted of a way of telling you that the mother had died. There's, so there's a, the big thing with this movie it's you know it's supposed to be a comedy I'll, I'll you know you'll see more of it as I describe it but it, it's supposed to be a comedy that is in the vein of Home Alone and it's like you know Macaulay Culkin's character is this troublemaker kid you know but he's really smart and he's outsmarting these guys that are doing this heist and stuff and it, it's it's fucking stupid. But anyway, there's a bunch of awkward interactions with everybody. I mean, everybody on screen has an awkward interaction or two, but Ted Danson has an interaction with Macaulay Culkin that he, he asks him if he's dating and Culkin is like, I'm 11. And Ted Danson is like, yeah, that's, that's good that you wait. You know, I didn't start dating until I was 11 and a half. And it was just crickets. It was, it was supposed to be funny. And it was just, it fell so flat for me. I couldn't fucking believe it. And it it was just, it's like it was supposed to be an awkward comment to make, but it was also, who was, who was supposed to be laughing at that? Because it fucking, it wasn't me. You know what I mean? If he would have made that joke in front of another adult and the other adult would have laughed, I would have been like, that wasn't funny enough for you to fucking laugh at. I'm sorry. Basically, I mean, Macaulay Culkin knows that his dad and and the other two guys are planning this heist. He's just, you know, he, he knows that they're up to no good. He just doesn't know what their, you know, 
plan is. He, he hasn't discovered it yet. And lo and behold, he's he, he's like playing basketball, like jumping on the bed and he dunks into a trash can and a newspaper falls out of the trash can and circled in red marker is this fucking article about this this coin these rare coins that are being transported and this is what you know like how he finds out that his dad is orchestrating a coin heist right and so he doesn't go to great lengths to stop his dad from doing it because I don't think he finds out soon enough if I remember right so he like once he determines that's what they've done he gets a hold of the coins and basically holds them ransom because they're supposed to be, you know, selling these coins to to a buyer and and the buyer is delaying them for a week. So basically Macaulay Culkin is just gonna fuck with these guys and make them do shit that they don't want to do, like go to the park and go to baseball games and museums and aquariums and shit like that. And it, it's just, my God, it, it is, wow. It's so stupid. I mean, so that's that's the premise, okay? We get a lot of, uh, gen- like, and then mixed in with the sentimental score, we get this, like, super generic guitar music. Generic guitar music is never a good choice for a score because I literally cannot think of a time, because I... I I can't think of a movie that uses it. I can't I definitely can't think of a movie that uses it successfully and does it, you know, and it's it's good. Another note is uh I saw, you know, basically there's a scene where Macaulay Culkin is laying out what's happening and he's explaining it to these these ex-cons and his dad and he is eating like a sandwich and drinking plain milk and I just fucking gag. A- anytime I see somebody drinking plain milk, I just gross fucking gross if it's a situation where you're eating something very chocolatey like a chocolate chip cookie or a a brownie absolutely plain milk is fine but plain milk any other situation i can't fucking do it can't can't do it a little bit not only with the score but they also the soundtrack has some old soul tunes and you know rock soul tunes and one that they use during the opening credits is money by barrett strong which is you know the one where it's like the best things in life are free but you can give them to the birds and bees you know it's just that kind of thing that song you know it plays the whole opening credits and then they bring it up again in this movie as they're going around you know like they're they're talking about these coins and they're 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 having to go around and do these things that Macaulay Culkin's character wants to do. It's just fucking terrible. I I looked, you know, I I took a break from watching the movie at about 32 minutes in. And when I paused it and I saw how long the runtime of the movie was, which was an hour and 49 minutes roughly, I was like, there's no fucking way this movie needed to be this long at all. There are a million fucking things in the first 30 minutes that I could have cut out of this movie and it would have been fine. They go to the, they go to the, so they, they're doing these things that Macaulay Culkin wants to do, and they go to an aquarium, and Ted Danson says, how did you get so smart? And Macaulay Culkin says, I don't know, it certainly doesn't run in the family. And Ted Danson laughs lightly, and I just, I was stone-faced. I mean, in, in their defense, I am, I'm not an easy laugher, you know, like I'd, I I would struggle to laugh at certain things, especially like when I'm by myself, it's like there's nobody to to spur me in that direction, you know, so it's like whatever, but it, it was a, a fucking terrible joke just to give you the basis of like why this movie is so notoriously bad. It's just jokes like that that are, that they just don't land at all. They go to a baseball game and a... And one of the the ex-con friends, the uh, I think his name's Bobby, he trips and falls on some souvenir bats. And then, like, a comically smaller uh, stuntman steps in and does the fall all the way down the stairs. And it is so... It, there's such a stark contrast between the actor and the stuntman that you couldn't fucking believe how how, how much it didn't look like that guy. It was... It was that bad. Uh, Macaulay Culkin is, 
you know, I never really thought Macaulay Culkin was a particularly great actor. I mean, he was a child actor, so it was like, you, you grade him on a curve, right? But, I mean, the thing is, it's like, I never thought he was that good, even by... Because, I mean, there are some really good child actors. You know, there are child actors that can really fucking bring their A-game and they know what they're doing. But with Macaulay Culkin, it was always... He was decent. He was he was good enough that he wasn't so bad I couldn't stand to watch movies that he was in. But he, he's not anything special. And in this movie, it's probably the worst I've seen of him. And, I mean, he was really young in Uncle Buck. And he had to, like, you know, he had to be reading lines off of, you know, cue cards, basically. Uh, I think they said something about uh, John Candy had his, had Macaulay Culkin's lines taped, like, on a card to his back or something, so he would remember what to say. Ted Danson's also, Ted Danson's doing this, he's, he's terrible in this movie, and he is doing this fucking accent, like, it's like a forget about it kind of, you know, well, you know how it goes. You know, I mean, he's just like, he's not really, like, he doesn't sound like Sylvester Stallone and Rocky, but he doesn't, he doesn't sound like Ted Danson does. You know what I mean? Because Ted Danson himself does not really have an accent that I can tell. I, I have to blame the director of this movie because the director, you know, I, I, I read his resume. I mean, he's clearly not very gifted and doesn't really have an eye for corrections that need to be made when to call cut when to reshoot something whatever we get we get a lot of shitty comedic gags like physical comedy like i talked about the guy falling down the steps there's also another gag with the same guy where somebody goes to cast a fishing rod and the hook and lure like catch on the guy's face and he's like, oh, oh, you know, like he's doing this weird fucking thing with his, you know, he's acting like he's like in, you know, such incredible pain, which it wouldn't feel good. But it's it's like such a fucking age old joke, you know, like, oh, yeah, let's have this fish hook catch on somebody's face. There's a scene where Culkin is he's dancing and lip syncing to the song. Do you love me by the contours? Right. And so he does this and it's like, what are you doing? Like, what, what is this? You know what I mean? Like, it's just this, this scene in this movie that it's like that fucking cut that out. You know what I mean? This movie is an hour and 49 minutes long and it has no business having a scene like that in it. If you need to cut some shit, you know what I mean? If it were 90 minutes and it had something like that in it, I would say, oh, okay, I get it. They were just trying to get it to 90 minutes. So they left that in. But that was not the case. They also, he was also terrible at lip syncing, by the way. He was, like, he he really did not, like, I mean, he lip synced in fucking Home Alone. And he did fine, I thought. But this movie, fucking terrible. He makes a bet with the guys that, you know, because he, he's taken these coins away from them. And he's got them somewhere for safekeeping. And they don't know where that is. And he changes, the, he calls every night wherever it, it's being stashed and he changes the password and he tells the person that if if he doesn't call every night to you know like within 24 hours they need to take the uh, you know the the coins to uh police headquarters or whatever and it's like okay and so they have this they go play putt putt which is what i call miniature golf i don't know what you call it i call it putt putt anyway you have this bet where Culkin, for some reason, like I don't know why he would risk this, but he says he'll, you know, for he'll play them, all three of them, and if if he wins, they get to go to Baskin Robbins, but if he loses, he'll tell them where the coins are and how to get to them and all that stuff. And of course, you know, they don't fucking win, blah, blah, blah. I noticed while this putt-putt is happening, Danson is, you know, they're showing their different shots and they're showing them making their way through the game of putt-putt. And Danson, it's just like the the one in Happy Gilmore where he's he's hitting the ball and it goes up the clown's tongue and the clown's teeth come down and stop the ball. And Danson 
clearly waits until the teeth start coming down to hit the ball. And of course the ball doesn't go through and he fucking loses his shit about it. And it's like, what are you fucking expecting to happen, Dead Dancing? There, there are just so many... <laughs> Glenn Headley's dress... Um, it, she's, she's dressed pretty horribly and like her coworker points it out to her. And so she changes into something a little more presentable because she's going to try and like go undercover, so to speak with, uh, and like talk to Ted Danson and stuff. So, you know, she's not like that particularly good looking, but she, you know, she does look way better. I'll give her that. I, I feel like just throughout this movie, everything all the interactions, they don't feel like good interactions. They don't feel like well-written interactions at all. And like, I'm, I'm not exaggerating when I say there's hardly a good interaction that doesn't feel flat. I mean, it's that bad. So at one point, Macaulay Culkin convinces the two other guys to, you know, stay behind because they're convinced they're going to find like a treasure map and find the coins and then Macaulay Culkin and Ted Danson go out and do whatever. And the whole sequence of them following the treasure map throughout the city, it should have been hilarious, you know? It should have had a lot of funny moments. And man, oh, God. I mean, one of them falls in a dumpster at one point, And, you know, I mean, just... It, it's such stupid shit, you know what I mean? It, it, it's so fucking lazy. And then they end up, you know, after this treasure map there they end up in a church and it, it just it's so stupid what they're doing like they like he clearly like Macaulay Culkin has clearly led them on a wild goose chase and they should have realized that by now but they, they just don't want to believe that he's that smart and they end up at a church they think that they found it they go to you know they basically like end up thinking that the coins are there and they take the container that they think the coins are in and it's actually like the sacrificial wine or, you know, whatever the hell it's. So I don't, I don't know church stuff. I'm really sorry. I, I honestly don't. But it's like, it ends with this like horrendous song that I don't even, I don't know what they're going for with it. I'd never heard the song before. It was, but it was really bad. It's, I, I kept noticing that jokes would be made on the screen and... One of the actors would tell the joke and then another actor would like chuckle at the joke. And whenever, you know, if if it's a funny joke, I'm going to laugh as a viewer. I don't need the actors on the TV to tell me that it's time to laugh because I should fucking know when it's time to laugh. That didn't happen. Like they, they kept laughing at the, the jokes because they thought it was going to like clue people in to like chuckle at stuff, but it was not ideal. I mean, it was just, not not my cup of tea. Uh, none none of the jokes landed. Um, I I don't. I I kept noticing that I wasn't feeling anything for these characters. You know, I wasn't really. I I wasn't really loving any of the things that they were doing. Uh, I I didn't really sympathize or empathize with them at all. I just as I'm watching, I'm just like, who gives a shit about this kid? Like he's he's not a particularly enjoyable, likable kid. You know, he's he's kind of a dingus too. You know, and then. Ted Danson's, you know, obviously he's like a criminal. And so it's like, do I really want him to, you know, do I want this police officer to act like she's being won over by him? Fuck no. Like, and, and I obviously don't care about those, those two guys that go on the treasure hunt. Like I, I really don't give a shit about what they're, what they're doing or, and I also don't care about the police investigation None of it is, is, you know, appealing to me at all. Uh, there's, there's one line that was only one thing left to do, break out the floppy shoes and funny noses. Cause we sure as hell look like clowns. Crickets, just fucking crickets across the board. Holy shit. And that was, that was read by like the police chief or something. You know, there's like, it's like one of these gags where like one of the, uh, the con, the ex cons is eating a chili dog and he you know he he goes to bite into it and he like basically like deliberately dumps it on himself and tries to make it look like an accident you know and it just is so fucking stupid um uh, and then they bring up fucking after that they bring up money by barrett strong again they fucking do it again i just i can't fucking believe it so okay those were my notes for the movie and 
and I, I'm going to have less notes for serving Sarah, but these are my notes for, okay, casting notes. And this was my favorite thing ever because it's so absurd. I can't even believe it. Casting notes. Tom Hanks, Mel Gibson, Harrison Ford, Bill Murray, Kevin Costner, Sylvester Stallone, Michael Keaton, Bruce Willis, Kurt Russell, Tim Allen, and Robin Williams were all considered to play Ray Gleason, which is Ted Danson's character. So was it just basically every fucking actor on the face of the earth at the time? I mean, that was every popular actor that there was, and they went with Ted Danson? I think not. Like, I think they wanted to get those guys, and all of those other guys were smart enough to say, no, 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 I'm not getting in this Macaulay Culkin movie. I don't think that, you know, they, they've captured lightning in a bottle or whatever and like they're gonna actually land it with this there's a couple of scenes where Macaulay Culkin is recording with a video camera and he's like narrating and it's it's just the un the unfunniest of unfunny I just I oh god and and fucking Ted Danson's voice it keeps coming and going with the accent and so it's just it really fucking stupid as far as praise I guess I could say the movie was not shot completely terribly you know it wasn't like one of those laughably bad productions so that's something glenn headley seems like she acts well in this movie she doesn't seem like she does bad given the subject matter and the the writing criticisms would be you know ted danson's shitty ponytail most of the acting by anybody else especially culkin and danson i don't feel any sympathy for these characters the story is underwritten the jokes fall flat the bad guys are cartoonish it just it all feels like it wants to be a home alone type movie so bad and it's just not so there, there's also a little bit I wanted to talk about. I was reading on Wikipedia, because I always try and find something out about these movies to talk about. And one thing that they said on Wikipedia was, Macaulay Culkin's character was supposed to have a short haircut in this movie, but Culkin, who had let his hair grow at the time, liked his looks and did not want to cut it. His father, Kit Culkin, demanded his son be allowed to keep his hair the way it was, pointing out that his character was a working class boy and not a clean cut prep school one. He got to keep his long hair. Okay, pretty uninteresting piece of trivia and it, it'll remain that way. But then there was, I looked on IMDb to see if there were any trivia there or there was any trivia there. And it said, Macaulay Culkin was given time to let his hair grow out in order to play Timmy Gleason. But as soon as filming was done, Culkin wasted no time in getting his hair cut back to the way it was. So like, which is it? Is it that he was just, he wanted his hair long? Or is it that they had him grow it out and he wanted to cut it short? Fuck off. Um, Culkin earned a Razzie Award, which, say what you want. I mean, like, the Razzie Awards are iffy to me. They're not particularly cool i mean it seems funny on the surface but like giving people awards for achievements and badness for movies is it's not that funny i mean like especially if you look up like halle berry going to the fucking razzies to accept her catwoman award for worst actress it's not pleasant like it's it's an unpleasant thing to watch her like laugh about how terrible the thing she did was uh, this film marks the second time that a cast member from the situation comedy Cheers played Macaulay Culkin's father. The first was George Went in the music video Michael Jackson Black or White in 1991. Who gives a flying shit about that? The cake shop Danson's character works in is the same meat shop seen in So I Married an Axe Murderer. That's confusing wording. I mean... It's the same meat shop. It's, I mean, it's the same building as the meat shop, I'm assuming is what that means. Anyway, uh, the runtime of this movie, it says 104 minutes, but on Prime Video, which is what this is on, by the way, uh, it said 109 minutes, but whatever. It was way too fucking long. It should not have been anywhere near as long as it was. The budget was $30 million. The worldwide gross was $35 million. IMDb rating 4.8. Rotten Tomato Critics score 3%. Rotten Tomato Audience score 24%. Personal rating 1.5 out of 5 stars. I don't know what the 0.5 
really got you, but uh, it's terrible. Don't fucking watch this movie, even as a joke. Serving Sarah, released on August 23rd, 2002, directed by Reginald Hudlin. Hudlin? Okay. He directed House Party, Boomerang with Eddie Murphy, The Great White Hype. I think that has Samuel L. Jackson in it. I think I've seen the cover of that. The Ladies' Man which is that Tim Meadows Saturday Night Live type movie. Marshall, which I've heard of. I can't remember if I've seen it or not. The Black Godfather. No idea what that is. And Safety. Never heard of it. Producers. So Dan Halstead was the producer on this movie. And actually, not all terrible movies. You know, he did Garden State, Any Given Sunday, The Virgin Suicides, SWAT, The Art of War, Nixon, composer, Marcus Miller. He clearly collaborates with the director a lot. He uh, he did uh, House Party, Boomerang, and then he did Above the Rim. He did The Great White Hype, The Sixth Man, and Head of State with Chris Rock. Star of this movie is Matthew Perry, who you probably know from Friends. He plays Joe Tyler in this movie, who is like one of these, I can't even remember what, the, I already forgot what the title of, uh, you know, like what their profession is, but he's basically one of these people that serves people their subpoenas, you know? So he was in Friends as Chandler Bing. He was in Fool's Rush In with Salma Hayek. He was in Almost Heroes, Three to Tango, The Whole Nine Yards, and The Whole Ten Yards for that matter. The Kid, I think with Bruce Willis, I think that's that was with him, yeah. He was in 17 again with Zac Efron, who I still would argue, like, by now Zac Efron is old enough to be as old as Matthew Perry was probably playing in that movie, and I, I don't think there's much resemblance at all. We've got Elizabeth Hurley, who is hot. I mean, I bad movie or not, I... I am always compelled to point out when somebody is hot and Elizabeth Hurley is very good looking. She plays Sarah Moore in this movie. Uh, she was in Dangerous Ground with Ice Cube, Austin Powers, Ed TV, Bedazzled, which I've covered on my blog site, uh, brandonetrandom.wordpress.com. One movie that I would consider seeing with Wesley Snipes that she's in is uh, Passenger 57. Apparently, it's like one of her first movies. I don't know. I've never heard if it's any good, and I didn't really look into it to see if it was a decently rated movie. Bruce Campbell plays uh, Sarah's husband, Gordon Moore, you know, Elizabeth Hurley's character. Uh, he plays her her husband. You know, you know Bruce Campbell from the the Evil Dead movies. You know, he's in all three of them. Uh, Evil Dead, Evil Dead 2, and uh, Army of Darkness. Yeah, sure. I, I'm not a big fan of the Evil Dead movies. I can't get into them. I don't, I don't get what's so appealing about them that, you know, so many people rave about them as being these great fucking movies, you know, and I just, I can't get there. You know what I mean? I'm just, I, I don't love them. Bruce Campbell makes a cameo appearance in uh, the three Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies with Tobey Maguire. Uh, he always plays a different character. Uh, he was in Dark Man with Liam Neeson, The Hudsucker Proxy, Congo, The Quick and the Dead. You know, basically everything that he's in outside of Evil Dead is a bit part. You know, he's not really a leading man type outside of those movies. Uh, Vincent Pastor is the character Tony, who is like a rival of Matthew Perry's at the uh, the agency they work for or whatever. Um, he was on, uh, I mean, he pl he's, his name's Tony in the in the movie, but he, he was on The Sopranos. He was in Carlito's Way, which I need to revisit. He was in The Hurricane. He was in Corky Romano, and that's, I mean, I don't know what the fuck else. I mean, Terry Terry Crews is in this movie. I love Terry Crews. It's it's too bad that this had to be, like, on his resume so early. It really had to hurt him. But anyway, Jerry Stiller has a little bit role in this movie. Uh, Cedric the Entertainer was in this. How do I put this movie? It, it's just, it's just not... It's bad. I mean, it, it's just bad, guys. It's not... So, there's, like... You know, back and forth where, like, you know, I saw some trivia items where they were basically, like, praising Matthew Perry's improvisational skills. And they said that he came up with these one-liners on the spot for a lot of them. But any of the ones that I could think of that he said in the movie, I was like, no one should have been proud to have written that 
or to have performed it on an improv level, you know, like you should not be proud of yourself for that. That's like, it's mostly terrible. Like for instance, he calls his coworker, Tony Nostra dumbass. And I'm like, okay. And like, he's, you know, trying to call him dumb. He's doing it in just the worst way possible. It really doesn't fucking work for me. I I, I guess, I mean, I, I feel like I've never noticed this before, but there aren't many Elizabeth Hurley movies. Uh, Elizabeth Hurley is not a good actress. She's, I, I didn't ever think she was bad in Austin Powers, but I love Austin Powers. So, and she's also overwhelmingly attractive. So that's, it's tough to say. I mean, this was only like five years after Austin Powers but there there are a couple of things about this. So the the basis of this movie is Matthew Perry goes to serve papers to Elizabeth Hurley's character, Sarah. And after he serves her, she convinces him to flip on her, um, you know, on turning her in and get her husband because I, I don't really know. I don't understand. Like, I don't believe that the way they presented it in this movie is how it actually works. But they said that basically like if the husband served her papers for divorce, they would have to, to have court in Texas where he is. And she, if she would have served him papers for divorce, they would have had to do it in New York. Right. Okay. So I don't know that that's, actually true i have no idea i assume it's actually probably your place of residence you know that would be the most logical explanation to me but i don't know but i did read that so when matthew perry goes to serve elizabeth hurley like she tricks him and she gets away originally and she runs they they have this big foot chase and he ends up tracking her down and you know whatever but it turns out that, like, actually, the the way serving people papers works, and I don't know how much of this stuff actually happens, like, with people pretending to be flower delivery services, and they, they're they actually serving papers. I don't know how often that goes on. I, I know that in the, like, what I looked up on this movie, basically, if you want to serve somebody papers, you send it certified mail or you tack it to their front door. Or if if that doesn't, if neither of those two work, you can ask the court to have the papers served in a different way. But it doesn't sound to me like they had tried the first two. You know what I mean? Because as far as she knew, you know, Elizabeth Hurley's character does not realize that anything's happening, that anything's awry. You know what I mean? So they could have easily just done that. So as I mentioned, there is, you know, you see some familiar faces. You see Jerry Stiller. He's kind of like a, a guy that's that Matthew Perry's bribing to, to help him. And th- the thing about this movie is, you know, everywhere that Matthew Perry goes where he's supposed to be serving somebody, he is doing this like character, you know, he's pretending to be somebody and he does, you know, pretends to be British. He pretends to be, you know, Latin. And I, I don't, I, it, it's fucking bad. He's not good at it. And it's not, he's not saying anything that's humorous, you know? I mean, that's the worst part. There's a scene on a bus where, you know, basically the, the scene where Matthew Perry and Elizabeth Hurley make their deal that Matthew Perry's going to work for her. And he says, I'm going to kill that son of a bitch about, I think like his coworker or whatever. And this, this kid who's like a little overweight next to him kind of gives him a look like what the fuck dude. And Matthew Perry says, mind your own business, pork chop. And I'm like, this is the guy I'm supposed to be rooting for. This is the guy that is supposed to be likable and, you know, relatable. They play a fucking, ugh, I'm sorry. I won't get started on this, but I'm not a, I'm not a fan of Kid Rock and they put Kid Rock in the soundtrack and it's, it's like that cowboy baby song. Ugh, not a fan. I, I mentioned Perry's English accent is the worst. I get the sense that they want me to laugh at these quote unquote jokes throughout the movie that just are are much like the last movie I talked about. Terrible. Just, I mean, just awful. There's a scene where they have like a uh, a luggage conveyor at the airport and somehow, I can't remember exactly how, but Elizabeth Hurley gets caught on the conveyor and Matthew Perry has to rush over to save her and her jeans are caught in the conveyor. And so Matthew Perry rips them off which by the way that would not be as easy to do like to just rip jeans that 
quickly. Like, especially they make Matthew Perry out to be this total fucking weakling in this movie. But anyway, he he rips off, like, half of her pants. Like, one pant. It, it, she's got, like, just underwear on underneath, which I'm like, that's... I'm, I'm so glad that you, you know, wanted to be classy enough to have that scene in your movie where we have to see Elizabeth Hurley in her underwear. But whatever. They show a guy following an actual map like a, a paper map in this movie. And I just thought, man, the past was exhausting. I mean, just fucking terrible. And Mike Judge is in this movie. Apparently he was like a last minute replacement. He wasn't supposed to be in this. And he agreed to be in the movie. And he plays this this guy behind the counter at a, a motel lobby. And Matthew Perry is pretending to be like a headquarters, you know, corporate guy who's inspecting the place. And Mike Judge basically tells him to fuck off. And Elizabeth Hurley, who is wearing, like she found this getup where she's wearing a, she's wearing a t-shirt that says trailer trash on it, which I don't know who that shirt is for. Who is... Who is using a shirt that says trailer trash on it? Like, the only way is, like, if if you were really just trying to be that ironic, I guess. But it's so bad. And she's wearing that, and she's wearing this, like, schoolgirl skirt. And it's, I mean, she, Elizabeth Hurley, I mean, she looks good, but, like, what the fuck? But anyway, she's like, so Matthew Perry doesn't win Mike Judge over at the counter. And so she's like, let me see if I can do it. And she like tries to convince him for a minute. And then she just flashes him. And it's like such a tired bit to do in a movie of like, oh yeah, this guy, you know, if he, you know, sees your boobs, he's going to do whatever you want him to. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's kind of fucking dumb, but what can you do? And I said that Mike Judge's scene in this movie was the best scene and it was terrible. It was a terrible fucking scene. When they're in the motel room, Perry and Hurley are talking to one another and, you know, they're kind of getting sentimental and talking about how they ended up where they're at and all this stuff. And Matthew Perry says his dream is to own his own vineyard. And I was like, that's the lamest fucking, you know, lamest thread of any story anywhere, like, ever. I can't, I can't fucking believe that they put that in as, like, the thing he wanted in this movie. Terry Crews' character, he, he reminds me a lot of Ice from Arrest Development, who is, like, a no-nonsense bounty hunter guy. He, but, I mean, Terry Crews is actually, for the kind of movie this is, he does as good as he can, you know? My question to you is, yet again, is Matthew Perry a good-looking guy? Is he, I mean, same way with Ted Danson. Is, are they good-looking people? If Matthew Perry is, like, I get the tall and dark thing with, with Ted Danson a little bit, but Matthew Perry, what's, is he good-looking? Really? Tell me. And I'm happy to answer these questions on, if you want to know if I find somebody attractive, sure. You know, I, I could probably tell you if it's not something too personal, you know, if, if they're not standing right there, that could be awkward. But there's a scene also in this movie where they're at the husband's ranch. This guy comes out of a barn and just assumes that this man and woman in plain clothes, like Elizabeth Hurley, Hurley is wearing her like trailer trash get up. The guy just assumes he's a, that, Mike, uh, that Matthew Perry is a veterinarian and that he's, he's there to help them uh, masturbate this bull and they show the scene where, you know, Matthew Perry has this big, long plastic glove on and he's reaching his hand down in the bull to, you know, to get to the prostate or whatever. They show, they have an animatronic, you know, like, I don't know if this is something they really do. It probably is, but it's like a fake animatronic bull or not bull, a cow. It's like, it's eyes open and it's it has expressions and I'm like, I don't fucking think so. I don't think they're going that far with this shit, but I don't know. But it, that old quip of like, it's it's like in Jingle All the Way when they're like looking for the guy to play Turbo Man and they just find Arnold Schwarzenegger and they're like, oh, you're, you're the guy, right? And Arnold Schwarzenegger's just like, oh uh, yeah, uh-huh. So there's, I'll give another example of a bad joke in this movie. They're trying to figure out how to masturbate this bull or to get it aroused, basically. And Matthew Perry says, 
have you tried playing a Barry White CD? And Elizabeth Hurley is like, ha ha, no one, no one reacts to him at all, uh, including myself. There's a scene where, you know, Tony, the guy that Matthew Perry works with, he gets shot and he's having bullets pulled out of his ass and the nurse goes to shave him and the shaver she's using is like flinging hair everywhere and it's like, what shaver does that? Why would you want a shaver that did that? Matthew Perry does his Latino voice, which is exceptionally bad. Uh, he is enamored. You know, he goes to, it's it's the husband's house. It's Elizabeth Hurley's husband's house. And it's it's like he, he gets in there with this Latin accent pretending to be the housekeeper's second cousin or something. He's just in love because he sees this giant wall of wine. And I'm like, who, who gives a shit? You could go fucking anywhere in the world and find that. That's not impressive, you know? I, I just don't, I don't get it. And I mean, they end up basically like forcing this romantic connection between Matthew Perry and Elizabeth Hurley. And it just, it it's not there. Like, so Elizabeth Hurley is filling up this tub. And as he's kissing her, the tub starts to overflow. And it's like, it fills up in record time. And when he points it out to her that the tub is overflowing... She runs away and he kind of smiles like, ha, tricked you, you know, like got out of having to kiss Elizabeth Hurley. Ha ha ha. You know, like what, what is this? You know, one of my biggest criticisms is, is that this could have easily destroyed Terry Cruz's or Amy Adams's careers because this was before Amy Adams was even on the office and Terry Crews had not done jack shit before this movie. Just a few notes, uh, trivia type things. Uh, Matthew Perry apparently was in rehab for painkillers at one point, which slowed production. Okay. So apparently they shot a bunch of scenes that he didn't appear in to keep production moving. One of the trivia items was a good number of Joe's Matthew Perry's character, witty, sarcastic remarks were improvised by Perry. Wow. I mean, that's impressive. Because there's not one thing in here that I'd be like, oh yeah, I thought of that on my own. I, 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 you know, put my seal of approval on that one. When Joe Tyler is trying to serve Gordon Moore in the arena and the camera is focusing on the table's clock at seven o'clock, we can see fair play written on the table, which is ironic given the context. That is not trivia. That is not anything. Stop fucking posting this shit to IMDb. It's so fucking stupid. I don't even understand why. Why did, Why would you put that? It's ironic given the... It's not... It's That's not anything. That's not worth noting. That's not... Ugh. They point out that Matthew Perry's weight changes throughout the movie, as can be seen by the size of his neck. Matthew Perry's weight change was due to his drug addiction that occurred wh while filming. Wow. You know, as I mentioned, you really usually to serve somebody papers, you just have to certified mail, deliver it to them. There's a scene in the end of the movie where Bruce Campbell's character is struck in the head by a three pack of beer, like three cans of beer hit him in the head and it doesn't knock him out cold like it would in a lot of movies, but it knocks him over. And I'm like, I don't think if I got hit in the head, even from like a great distance above me, I don't think that that would knock me out like, or knock me down. I should say, I, I don't like that, that old gag of, of people being knocked over or knocked out by those things. It's always fucking stupid. This film really wants me to feel like I was rooting for the Perry Hurley romance all along. The runtime of this movie, 99 minutes, budget $29 million, worldwide gross to date, $20.1 million, IMDb rating, 5.3, Rotten Tomato Critics score, 4%, Rotten Tomato audience score, 26%. Personal rating, 1 out of 5 stars. Thank you very much. All right, everyone. Uh, always, you know, send me your ideas. Thanks. Have a good day.
Brandon at Random Reviews is performed, written, directed, produced, and edited by Brandon Griffiths. Theme music is performed by Augusto Diniz from Fiverr. 